Hi, everyone. This is Julie Wolf with the American Society for Microbiology here with another Microbial Minutes. We're going to talk about what important things have happened in microbial sciences in the last two weeks. This is a session that happens every couple of weeks. So if you're interested in this kind of information, go ahead and hit subscribe on your YouTube uh, screen right there. All right, what are we going to talk about today? We will talk first a little bit about bacterial evolution. Then we're going to talk about a few different vaccines, um, the typhoid vaccine and an HPV vaccine. And then we have an influenza extravaganza where we're going to talk about the H7N9 avian influenza and its transmissibility, as well as the seasonality of influenza, ending on a little bit about the influenza universal vaccine. All right, let's jump right in. Um, so the first paper is from Nature, and this is a paper entitled The Dynamics of Molecular Evolution Over 60,000 Generations. Take-home message from this is that scientists have observed codependent subpopulation evolution. So this is from, um, a result that is stemming from the E. coli long-term evolution experiment. This is an experiment that is so famous that you can go to Wikipedia to learn more about it. It has its own Wikipedia page that has a whole lot that's been written um, in the last 30 years um, because that's how long this experiment has been going on. This experiment started in February of 1988. Uh, so that may be before some of the listeners have were born, not before this person, but uh, it's, it's nearly 30 years old. And the way that this experiment is run is that there are 12 evolving populations that are independently evolving in different flasks. So you can actually see those in the um, flasks in the Wikipedia page over here on the right. And every day, the strains or the populations from those, um, from those mixed cultures are inoculated into a fresh flask with new media. So none of the conditions are changing other than the fact that the nutrients are being depleted over time within that 24 hour period before the, the re-inoculation. And the purpose of this very long-term experiment is to ask how do populations evolve? Scientists are taking advantage of the very short generation time of E. coli. E. coli under um, ideal conditions when it has just the right temperature and all the food that it needs can divide and become two E. coli cells in about 20 minutes. So that means in a 24 hour period that you can get 72 generations. Uh, so as you can study long-term um, evolution much more um, readily in this quickly dividing organism. Uh, and every 500 generations or so, the, uh, an aliquot of the population is taken and flash frozen. So it's basically freezing the genomic material, the transcriptome, um, and all of the proteins within the cells uh, as they are in that moment in time. And then they can be studied later on. Uh, and there's been many different papers that have been published based on this experiment. Such a long-term experiment will have results all the time. Um, some of the major findings so far are that the mutation rates differ between these um, independent flasks. Uh, and some of that has to do with mutations that have occurred in DNA repair machinery, which would seem natural. Um, there was also a paper that was published a few years ago about the ability of one of the populations um, to use citrate as its nutrient source. Citrate as a carbon nutrient source has never been described in any E. coli, uh, and so this was a pretty cool finding. So what this paper is doing is taking a genomic approach to understanding evolution. They are using whole genome sequences genomes from the population that, that has been frozen down every 500 generations or so. Um, and one of the big things that they had to do in that their analyses was to develop a pipeline that would differentiate a mutation that had arisen in a small pro uh, proportion of the population from a sequencing error uh, that would give you some sort of artifact. Uh, and so what they were able to see um, was to how the genomes within the individual flasks changed over time. And what they had expected to see, if we look at this um, graph on the right-hand side, was that every once in a while there would be a mutation that arises, as happens here in the, the, the mutation number one, and then this mutation confers some sort of benefit that allows it to overtake the previous population, in this case the unmutated cells here. And you can see that's what happened um, according to their genomic data. But what they observed um, in some of the flasks is that there would be two mutations that would arise independently. In this case, number two and number three are both arising in this number one background. So these are cells with number one and number two, and these are cells with uh, mutations one and three. 
And neither one of these was um, so beneficial that they were able to outcompete the other. And these two um, different genetic backgrounds would live in harmony or uh, both grow together, um, taking up their different proportions within that same population. Now, in this case, it's showing 50-50. It could be 10 and 90, um, just some sort of stable um, subpopulations that continue to have their own mutations that will arise and take over that entire population. As you see here, the teal is overtaken by um, further uh, mutations and the blue is overtaken by further mutations. Um, and this ability of the subpopulations to coexist, according to the authors, suggests interdependence among the subpopulations. So it could be that there is some sort of mutual benefit that is occurring between these blue and these teal cells. Perhaps it's a metabolite or um, detoxification or some sort of benefit that is allowing them to um, coexist for thousands of generations. This confirms some of the data that had been previously suggested through other means. Um, and the, uh, at the bottom here is a quote from the senior author, Rich Lenski, whose lab uh, has been doing this um, for the last 30 years. He was interviewed on a blog called Dynamic Ecology, which is an ecology-centric blog run by many different ecologists, and asked by ecology, ecologist um, Jeremy Fox if there were any results from the long-term uh, evolution experiment that are underrated. And Lenski answered that one of the more underrated results from the long-term evolution experiment is the evolution of long-term stable coexistence of different mutants derived from the same ancestor. That's confirmed here. And uh, this is actually from the commentary, a commentary that was written on the paper. Uh, but this is a really cool study because it allows scientists, including ecologists, to look at how populations evolve over tens of thousands of generations, which would not be po possible in any type of multicellular organism uh, that would might take, even, even something that divided as quickly as a day would not allow you to have this tens of thousands of generations. And so this was a, a big hit with many people on social media. It was written up in a few places. This is a technical, um, outlet, I think it's Ars Technica, if I recall correctly, uh, who summarized this by saying it's basically a time machine for bacteria, which is true. It, you can go back in time and see what those populations originally looked like um, at the point at which they were frozen. This was shared by many different people and commented on um, by users saying that we are living in the golden age of population and evolutionary genomics. This whole thing still blows my mind. It's a landmark paper and a sublimely beautiful creation. Uh, and was shared by the lead or the first author, Benjamin Good, who um, joined Twitter just to share this really cool study. Moving on, um, now we're going to move, move into vaccines. So we're going to talk about first a paper from The Lancet, uh, which is called, uh, entitled Efficacy and Immunogenicity of a VI Tetanus Toxoid Conjugate Vaccine in the Prevention of Typhoid Fever Using a Controlled Human Infection Model of Salmonella Typhi, a Randomized Controlled Phase 2B Trial. Take home message from this is that a new typhoid fever vaccine may increase efficacy, which is really good news. Um, and that's because um, typhoid fever, which is different than typhus, is caused by salmonella typhi and continues to be a major problem in developing countries, uh, especially areas like Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Southeast Asia. This is a, a bacterium that is spread by the fecal oral route, which means that contaminated foods and water can lead to infection. Uh, and so places that don't have very good infrastructure might not um, have the same type of treatment for wastewater um, can uh, continue to have this um, bacterium uh, cause endemic disease. And one of the um, terrible things about this particular disease is that it's becoming increasingly antimicrobial resistant. This is um, a big issue because even, even with drugs, the morbidity associated with typhoid fever is 1%. And without the use of drugs, it's one in five or 20% that can succumb to this disease. So uh, the inability to treat, uh, particularly in parts of the world where the um, medical infrastructure is not as strong, can lead to uh, a greater cost of human life. And there are a few um, available vaccines uh, that have been available for a long time. And in fact, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side is a vaccine campaign that happened in Texas uh, a long time ago in the 50s. This is a photo from the CDC where the, um, after a flood of the Rio Grande, there was uh, an outbreak of this typhoid fever. 
and using um, these is still a possibility in areas where there's outbreak um, in some of these other areas as well. Uh, these include a live attenuated vaccine. This is um, a, a version of that salmonella type V that cannot cause disease but allows the immune system to mount a defense to it. But this is in a formulation that's not very well suited for young children uh, because it's in a, a big old pill capsule that a lot of small children have a hard time swallowing. Uh, and then there's also an injection that, that uh, you can get. This is the VI capsular polysaccharide. It's the capsule that surrounds the outside of the bacterium. So by mounting an immune response to that polysaccharide, uh, then you can um, have a memory response that will inhibit the, the bacterium from colonizing and causing disease um, if you are exposed. But polysaccharides are really poor antigens or immunogens in young children because their immune systems are still developing. So you can see a theme between these two different um, these two different vaccines, and that's that they don't work very well in that very young population. And very young populations are often susceptible, particularly susceptible to some of these diseases. And so one of the things that we're testing here is a new type of vaccine that is a protein antigen capsule conjugate. So they're taking a known protein, in this case it's tetanus toxoid, uh, that is an inactivated toxin form of tetanus um, toxin, and they are chemically linking it to that same capsule polysaccharide. And the idea is that proteins that can cause that immune response um, will, uh, will allow young children to have that, uh, young and anyone who's exposed to it, to have that immune response that's going to cause good memory, good, good remembering of the, whatever that antigen is in the case that they are exposed to it again. And because that polysaccharide is attached to that protein, some of that memory response will be directed against the capsule but here. Uh, and what they're using is a human challenge model. So this is really interesting. They're taking volunteers, um, this study is run in England, uh, healthy adult volunteers to test the the efficacy of this protein antigen capsule conjugate who will be vaccinated either in a sham vaccine, in a vaccine with just the polysaccharide, or in a, a vaccine with the polysaccharide and the protein conjugate. Uh, and then they will see whether or not they are this protects them from a subsequent exposure to salmonella typhi. So this is um, some of the results from the paper. You can see the control group. Those are those that did not receive vaccine and would be a very bad group to uh, be sorted into in this type of study. And then there's the tetanus toxoid group and the polysaccharide alone. Polysaccharide alone is kind of purple. It doesn't show very well in this legend. Uh, and you can see that in when we're looking at the proportion of patients who were infected, uh, that means that they had um, salmonella typhi infection, uh, you can see here that there's actually quite a similar uh, protection uh, because the same amount of people became sick uh, These were pretty small groups. They're around 30 um, uh, in their low 30s um, or high 30s of volunteers. And um, the number of, of people that got sick were around the same in both the tetanus toxoid and polysaccharide only um, group. But what you can see is that when they measured the severity of that disease, looking at participants who came down with a fever of greater than 38 degrees Celsius, that's uh, a real severe case of salmonella typhi, you can see that those that received the tetanus toxoid uh, polysaccharide conjugate, many fewer of them had that severe course of infection, uh, suggesting that this would, uh, if not prevent colonization, at least prevent a very serious um, manifestation of disease. And so this was written up in the BBC. It was shared um, quite widely on social media. It was a little bit unclear to me on whether or not this was going to be deployed immediately. Um, in the BBC, uh, there was somebody from the WHO who was talking about um, this vaccine being recommended for um, young children and catch-up vaccination campaigns. Uh, but in the Lancet commentary that accompanied the piece, there was... Um, a comment that this highlights the need for phase three and four trials. So this is showing that it's safe um, in adults. There had been uh, effective um, as well, and there had been um, other studies on the safety of this particular vaccine. Um, either way, I think that this shows a, a good um, progress toward preventing some of those potentially drug-resistant infections um, in areas where salmonella typhi is endemic. Moving on quickly uh, to 
um, HPV. We're going to discuss something from the Journal of Internal Medicine. This was a, a report titled Human Papilloma Virus Vaccination of Adult Women Risk of Autoimmune and Neurological Diseases. Uh, and the take home message from this is that HPV vaccination is safe for adult women. This is important to point out because all vaccines undergo a very rigorous safety testing uh, method, uh, mechanism. And we don't talk about that very much about what that actually is. Um, this is um, important because there is increasing anti-vaccine sentiment. Uh, this figure that I'm showing you here is from a global survey on vaccine sent the sentiments of um, individuals about vaccines. And in this case, they were told to agree or disagree with the statement, I think vaccines are safe. And here they're showing a colorimetric um, map of the proportion of people saying that they disagree with the statement that I think vaccines are safe. So you can see that the uh, United States is pretty solidly salmon here. It is not one of the lowest. It's also not one of the highest with Russia and in particular France being the most anti-vaccine um, or the most wary of vaccines. Um, but this growing sentiment that vaccines are unsafe can lead to outbreaks. Um, and so what, what they're testing here is the safety of HPV vaccination in adult women. There have been many safety tests already in the young girls uh, and young women that are advised to take the, to um, to get this particular vaccine. This uh, HPV is spread sexually and can lead to cervical cancer as well as other cancers. And so the, I, I believe that most insurance companies only will pay for this vaccine up through around 20, 27. Um, and then after that, you have to pay out of pocket. But some women um, who want to lower their risk of cervical cancer will pay out of pocket. And so this is a safety study looking at the effects of vaccination on women aged 27 through 44. And what they did was to track populations of women who um, received the vaccine um, those are in blue here, and those that did not receive the vaccine, and to note the serious adverse events that might be associated with this vaccination. Most of these are autoimmune, so where the immune system um, becomes activated against part of the, um, the your own self. In this case, they're looking at thyroid, um, gastrointestinal, uh, the dermat dermatological or skin, um, uh, neurological, and you can see all of the incidences are plotted against the rate per 100,000 person years. So basically they're taking all of the people and um, all of their lifespans and adding them in together. At the blue and the red, there's no, there's no real difference between these. Uh, with the take-home message that there, there is no risk of these autoimmune or neurological diseases in adult women from getting HPV. Uh, this was highlighted, and this study was highlighted in uh, an Irish journal, journal.ie, uh, that said that major study finds HPV vaccine in women was not linked with 44 chronic cases, uh, where the lead author um, said this is the most comprehensive study of HPV vaccination safety in adult women to date. Uh, and this also this um, article also highlighted a local story where a bishop had previously claimed that the vaccine was only 70% safe, which was found to be false. Um, and in fact, the bishop was later informed that that was incorrect information um, and then was uh, a proponent of people getting the vaccine. However, this type of misinformation or um, poorly informed information is how some of these anti-vaccine sentiments are spread, really emphasizing the need for good education and communication about these types of studies. All right, we're going to move into um, influenza. Uh, we're going to discuss first a cell host and microbe paper that was titled a highly pathogenic avian H7N9 influenza virus isolated from a human ferrets infected via respiratory droplets. So let's um, talk quickly about avian influenza. Avian influenza is any type of strain that is passed between um, birds and occasionally uh, at very low levels. There may be a particular strain that can jump into people uh, and make that person sick with influenza, but that person is not generally considered cont contagious. That virus has um, has the ability to jump from chickens to people, but it cannot go from person to person just yet. And uh, you may have heard of the avian H5N1 influenza virus. That's um, a virus that has been in the news and has been watched by epidemiologists and uh, evolutionary uh, virologists for a long time because there's worry that that H5N1 will eventually person to person. 
Uh, but meanwhile, this H7N9 influenza virus has uh, jumped from birds into people. And now people are worried that it also will jump from uh, something that is only acquired from birds to something that's transmissible by people. So the take home message from this is that the ferret transmission of H7N9 influenza worries scientists. And it worries scientists because ferret transmission of uh, influenza is used as a model for transmission between people. The way that the influenza virus is transmitted between ferrets, the way that the um, that the epithelial cells are have their proteins modified by certain types of uh, sugars called sialic acids is, is similar to the pattern of modification in people. And so it's thought that if it can be transmitted in ferrets, that is a, a good predictor of whether it can be transmitted in people. And so in this particular case, um, we have a lovely graphical abstract from cell host and microbe. They took um, a highly pathogenic avian influenza H7N9. And it's important that this is highly pathogenic because there are also low pathogenic um, H7N9 viruses. And uh, it has to do with the different types of mutations that the, the genomes have acquired that allow them to either replicate at high temperatures, replicate more quickly, or cause greater inflammation, things like that. Um, and in this case, they tested its pathogenicity in mice and saw that um, mice succumbed very quickly um, to this particular virus. And then they also infected some um, ferrets and then incubated those infected ferrets with non-infected ferrets and saw that that virus was able to infect some of those, um, some of those uninfected animals. Uh, and so just to show you what that... Uh, what that looks like. These are the infected animals that are infected with different types of um, influenza virus. This GD3 is the human isolate. So this is a, a viral strain that they're working with that had already jumped from chicken to people and they infected ferrets with it. And you can see that there uh, was one, one ferret here that was infected um, within the pair. So the pairs are colored, uh, coded, and you can see that the time, um, days post-infection or exposure, are noted at the bottom here. And then the viral titer, or how many uh, viral plaque-forming units were able to be isolated from that particular animal, are shown on the y-axis. There are different types of mutations that have been found within this same background, this GD3, um, highly pathogenic H7N9 influenza virus. Uh, and so they tested some of those as well, and they saw that some of them in particular allowed um, more transmission. Here we have three out of four animals that were um, infected. Uh, and they compared this to a low pathogenic strain. So this is um, a and low pathogenic avian influenza that can infect um, the the ferrets and only infects one animal. It's kind of used as a control here. Um, and down here, this is the H5N1, um, also an avian influenza um, uh, strain that that was in 50% uh, out of their two um, pairs were able to be infected. Uh, these are to show that not all, um, it's, it's not a matter of transmitting more necessarily. Um, they, this was already known that these could these particular strains could transmit from one ferret to another. Uh, but the important take home message is that some of these highly pathogenic viruses um, can go between ferrets, whereas uh, what we like to see is no transmission into this particular exposed population. Another take home message from this um, that they tested was infecting mice and then treating them with neuraminidase inhibitors. Neuraminidase is what that N stands for. It's one of the glycoproteins that's um, coating the outside of the virus. And uh, one of the ways that we treat people um, who have influenza now is if you are diagnosed early, um, you can take neuraminidase inhibitors such as Tamiflu that would allow you to um, curb that, that infection and to make it be a less severe course of infection. Um, but this particular strain, when they tested it, showed much lower sensitivity to those neuraminidase inhibitors, suggesting that if H7N9, highly pathogenic avian influenza, did jump into people, that it wouldn't be as easy to treat uh, as some of the other virus um, or viral strains that are transmitting, with the caveat that they did isolate this particular virus from an individual who was treated with neuraminidase, and so they may have selected for that mutation themselves. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about when you might Oh, nope, sorry, just kidding. And so this, of course, was, was written up in many different um, uh, 
outlets. This is something that people are constantly worried about because influenza can spread so rapidly and cause such severe disease. Um, and so uh, where this was found was in China. And so the Smithsonian Magazine asked if China uh, is ground zero for a future pandemic. Um, this was shared widely on social media. Um, and uh, it was written up in the Atlantic, um, again, asking whether this worrying flu virus is going to go pandemic. Uh, and so if you're interested in reading more about that, we'll include links um, at the end of this live broadcast. We'll uh, include those and you can read for yourself what some of the researchers um, are, are thinking about the possibility of this particular strain becoming pandemic. But now we're, we are going to talk about when those pandemic viruses um, might arise. Uh, uh, this is from a paper in PLOS Computational Biology uh, entitled Seasonality in Risk of Pandemic Influenza Emergence. This is a group that wanted to use uh, modeling to predict when pandemics are likely to arise. And one of the things that they, the, that they found is that these influenza pandemics are more likely to arise in the spring. That might seem a little strange considering we know that influenza seasonality um, in the U.S. is just starting. We're just entering um, influenza season. It will last until mid or late March. Uh, and uh, one might just say, oh, well, those, those pandemics often arise at the same time. Um, but that was the question that these uh, researchers wanted to address with their modeling. They were using um, information in the past. So here we have in the light gray graphed the incidence um, in the United States of influenza virus. So you can see those peaks are generally around um, December, January. Sometimes there's a peak in um, uh, between February and March. Um, but uh, when you look at when past pandemics have hit the United States, you can see that that happens much later in the year. So they're graphing here the 1918 influenza pandemic, um, 57, uh, 77, uh, as even the 2009 um, H1N1 pandemic uh, aro arose later in the year. And so they wanted to model when these pandemics may arise using a two-strain influenza transmission model. Uh, and that's important because there's often a seasonal strain that may cause this seasonal peak uh, during our typical influenza season, while a pandemic strain uh, is circulating at the same time. Um, but perhaps not to the same amount as, as the um, as the seasonal strain. Uh, and so they they used some modeling. Uh, they took into account many different variables. They took into account humidity, transmissibility, um, the time of emergence of that second pandemic strain. So it might be something that is um, spreading at very low levels or um, is contained. Um, until a certain time within that influenza season. They looked at the size of the population contracting that seasonal influenza strain and um, took into account whether that could affect um, the, the susceptibility to the pandemic strain. And that's because there's a refractory period um, after seasonal influenza infection in many individuals. This isn't like um, across the board, but many individuals will uh, experience something called heterosubtypic immunity, where immediately after having been infected and um, uh, feeling better or uh, uh, resolving an influenza infection, the immune system is so ramped up that uh, for a very short period of time, that individual cannot be infected by a second strain, even if that second strain is a different strain of influenza. And that um, refractory period of um, uh, heterosubtypic immunity is around 42 days um, based on mouse experiments. And so what they were able to find is that the uh, likelihood of um, emergence is in the spring or summer. Um, now that's going to be based in part on how many people have been um, have been infected during the seasonal influenza strain with more people being infected, leading to greater protection against that potential pandemic strain. Uh, and so in uh, Helio.com, the lead author was, um, was quoted as saying, our study shows that this creates a narrow predictable window for pandemic emergence in the spring and early summer, which can help public health agencies to detect and respond to new viral threats. Uh, and so that means that um, there's a very short period of time when officials may be able to identify those potentially pandemic um, strains and hopefully ramp up uh, some sort of um, 
of way to prevent that from, from being transmitted between individuals. Uh, this is an important topic um, in part because of the seasonality of um, influenza, which differs in different parts of the world. We are just entering our um, period of influenza seasonality, but Australia is just leaving their period of influenza um, seasonality. You can see that um, this is an influenza incidence in Australia over the last five uh, years, and you can see that there's a peak here in uh, June through October. Uh, this is makes sense. The the seasonal seasonal influenza strains usually come from Southeast China, and so it's easier for them to move into areas in Oceania and the um, uh, South Pacific before they cross uh, and then enter into the U.S. Uh, however, if you look at that red line, those are the incidents of influenza in 2017, and that is more than twice as many people who have been reported. These are just the ones that are confirmed influenza cases. More than twice as many reported cases as the next highest incidence, which is in 2015. Um, this has been a really bad year for influenza in um, Australia and potentially bodes poorly for the US and uh, Europe as the influenza season starts to pick up in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so this this particular this has been written up in many different outlets. Um, you may already be aware of the bad influenza um, season that has been occurring in um, parts of the world. Uh, this is, here is highlighted in an article from the Irish Times, um, which ties together a potential um, mismatch of the influenza um, vaccine. Now, I haven't, I haven't read a lot about the mismatch of this potential vaccine being uh, why this high incidence. It could be that the, the virus itself is just more pathogenic. It could be that the, the vaccine does not match exactly. It looks like this H3 and 2 seasonal, seasonal um, influenza strain may have mutated a little bit. So there's different kinds of influenza um, mutations. It looks like that may have undergone a little bit of drift, um, which is where just a few nucleotides change, but enough so that it can escape some of the vaccine protection. Uh, and in this particular article, both the um, National Health Service in England uh, and avian influenza experts in the U.S. are talking about how concerned they are uh, about the upcoming, um, upcoming uh, seasonality of influenza. Uh, I would encourage you to get your influenza vaccine. I know ASM just had their, um, their in-house uh, uh, vaccine day, and it's always better to have some protection uh, than none. Um, so it uh, would help uh, everyone to have some better herd immunity, even if the vaccine is not quite as effective. Finally, of course, we have to get our influenza vaccine every year, but ideally um, the universal vaccine, one that protects against all strains for a long period of time, would help us to prevent having to get a vaccine every year and whether or not it matches with the previous vaccine, uh, the, the circulating strain. And so there is a meeting that was held recently. Uh, where you may recognize some of these names. These are um, uh, some very uh, big names in um, virology, in public health, uh, and it was a meeting that was held in order to identify what gaps need to be addressed to design that universal vaccine, um, with the goals outlined for improved efficacy, improved breadth of protection, so in, uh, protecting against different types of um, vaccines, improved duration of protection, so lasting for longer, uh, and when they talk about breadth of protection, they had, there was a very interesting slide that was shared by um, Gary Nabel, where you can see that there's different of breadth. We talk about universal vaccine um, as if one jab would protect us against all influenza strains, but it's possible that uh, we would be able to get even a subtype specific. So here, one jab that could protect against all um, hemagglutinin, such as H3, what we're having right now is potentially a mismatch between the vaccine and the circulating strain, if it were a better vaccine that could protect against all H3s, this wouldn't be an issue. Of course, ideally, we would be able to get an influenza virus or vaccine that would protect against all viral strains. So um, one inoculation that would protect you against H3, H1, H7, H5, all of the different um, hemagglutinin or H uh, variations that are out there. 
Uh, and of course, ideally, super ideally would be to protect against all the different viral species because influenza can be caused by influenza A virus. That is the one that we discuss most commonly. Those are the ones that we are worried about becoming pandemic. But there are also influenza B virus and influenza C viruses that can cause uh, similar courses of disease, usually a little bit less severe. All right, so uh, just to summarize the important things that have happened in the microbial sciences, um, we talked about how scientists have observed codependent subpopulation evolution, th that the new typhoid fever vaccine may increase efficacy, HPV vaccination is safe for adult women. Um, then we talked about how ferret transmission of H7N9 influenza worries scientists, uh, and that influenza pandemics are more likely to arise in spring. Uh, thanks for attending. If you are interested in hearing more about this, don't forget to subscribe. I'd like to thank Ray Ortega, and um, we'll talk to you next time on Microbial Minutes.